Hi, I'm Kenny, and this is the first episode of the second season of Kids in the Kitchen. I'm Brian, and as you can see, we have a brand new set. It's a state-of-the-art teaching kitchen provided by hy -Vee. And I'm Marissa, and we'd like to thank Chuck Donnelly, the store director, and Megan Delsing, the registered dietitian, for providing this wonderful facility. And I'm Maria Russett, and this is our executive chef, Jim Terry. So Jim, what do you think of this facility? It is gorgeous, and I can't wait to get to work in it. So Jim, what are we going to make today? We're going to make the corn soup recipe that people have been asking me for for about 15 years now. Uh, it uses very few ingredients, but it has a great flavor, a really wonderful aroma, and people come back again and again to have this soup at my restaurant. So let's make it. Now for my favorite segment of this show, Shopping with the Chef. In this portion of the show, we actually go into the store and shop with our chef, Jim Terry. So let's get shopping with the chef. Accompanying us today on our shopping trip is Megan Delsing, our registered dietitian. Megan, welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. We're excited to have you here at hy -Vee. We're excited to get busy making corn soup. Which way? This way. Four pounds is going to take care of what we need to four make. Pounds. Four pounds. And yeah, cheese. cheese! My favorite food. <laughs> We're going to start with this uh, mozzarella cheese from Organic Valley. This will be very nice. And this will add a little bit more richness to the soup as opposed to just pouring in a whole bunch of cream or something like that. Uh, excellent. In fact, let's get a little bit more just because. Or like sometimes cheese. better. Yeah, like and, and we might need some extra for afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. And now it looks as though, oh, milk. Yeah. We need milk. Yeah. At least a half a gallon. Let's see what we got going here. We're uh, two yeah. yeah, yeah. We can do skim. I think 2% will give us the richness that we require without going full blown with whole milk. Let's use this. That'll be very nice. And we need butter for the, for the melting of the onions that takes place. And this is a fantastic, super quality butter that I've been using for well over 15 years. Organic Valley, that's up in Lafarge, Wisconsin. We happened to visit there for Garden Organic this summer. That's right, we did. That was a great trip. We learned a lot about Organic Valley and hy V Foods, we carry a lot of Organic Valley products in our health markets. We sell a lot of them and people really enjoy the quality and um, the flavor of Organic Valley products. What's the next ingredient, Jim? We need four extremely large yellow or Spanish onions. Onions? I thought this was corn soup. Well, it's an ingredient, it's a constituent of the corn soup that creates the wonderful flavor that uh, delivers what the corn soup should deliver. Are they salubrious? <laughs> you bet they're salubrious. If we use onions this size, then we have to take more of them. Because normally I'm looking for a really large jumbo size. These are more of a medium verging on large. So we're going to take some. We're going to get some of these. Sweet yellow onions, though. That, that's the description. That is what we want. So let's get uh, six, I think. Yeah, uh, six, but these are actually a little bit smaller even than what I was thinking of. So we're going to shed a few tears, but it's going to be worth it. Ooh, now that's a nice globular one. And maybe circular. That's good. Now, we're looking for no soft spots, no uh, no dark patches. Also, we have to check inside because now that we're past the first of the year, we're going to see an increasing softness and more uh, anomalies with onions as we head towards the next crop. So we pick over pretty carefully and make sure we got good solid ones. Now, to some garlic, we need a head of garlic. And that's going to be, you was down before on the side over here, right? Garlic's coming heads? I thought they were used to taste 
sound good done we need a little bit of habanero chili sauce so let's, uh, right over here for number three that's good we've got a wedding cake okay we got it it's that's really hot <laughs> The, uh, we're going to be real careful how we use this hot chili sauce so it doesn't get too spicy. You know what can happen then. Yes. But this is a salsa that's made from, largely from habanero chilies, which are thought to be about the hottest chili that is made in fresh form. Uh, but they turn it into a sauce. I make my own sauce at the restaurant, which I'll probably actually be using today. But I want you to at least see that there are alternatives out in the supermarket that you can add that will fulfill the requirements of the recipe by adding something like this. One drop for me. A couple None of teaspoons will make it happen. Those are all the ingredients. Should we move back towards the kitchen then? Shopping with the Chef is a wonderful part of the program. We get to see the grocery store and find out where things are located. The kids get to find out more about the products too. Hi. <laughs> Look, the Tin Woodsman from The Wizard of Oz. Jim, I know what this is. It's a sieve. But what is this? This is an immersion blender. Uh, it sounds very complicated and intimidating, but there are home versions of this. This is a big heavy-duty restaurant version that I use. But uh, you can get sort of a mid-sized one that is still not a, not a cheap piece of equipment, but really you have to have something like this to perform this recipe. Because you can, putting hot soup in a regular countertop blender and switching it on, uh, you're setting yourself up to have the stuff splash either all over the, over the ceiling or all over you, and boiling hot scalding soup flying through space is not something you want to be playing with, really, because it's no fun. It's no fun. Um, what do we got to do first, Jim? First, Brian, we got to cry. We got to chop up some onions, and uh, there's various ways of reducing the impact of those fumes that make people's eyes tear up, but we haven't done any of those today, so we're going to face reality. Most importantly, we don't want to cry because we cut ourselves, and uh, so we have some nice sharp knives, and we're going to, at least two of us should probably start slicing because it's going to take a couple of minutes. We also need somebody to clean the garlic, and also somebody to grate the cheese. All the cheese. And we know how dangerous that can be, so uh, let's get at it. I know I appear to be emotional over this recipe, but it's actually the onions. Good. Jim? No. Yes? Was that supposed to be gang grating? Oh, you can actually do that over here because it's faster and easier. I mean, that's nice. That's, that's actually overkill. This will go faster. Yeah. It's a delayed reaction. See that that's still there? We want that to be gone. What's this? That's a big clove of garlic. So we take off the bottom where the root is. That just peels off very easily. Excellent. Hey, Jim. Yes. Are these okay? Yeah, those are fine. Those yes. are like little sprouty onion things. There? Mm, yes. Ah, uh, man, onions. Sorry, okay. heard me. We're oh, gonna take off some of this stuff. We have some of this slightly soft, translucent exterior. Like this? I'm still on it. Yeah, that comes off very good. You got it. And then we'll do this one over here. Nice. Okay. You ready to roll? Yes, may I have my onions? You may. It's all yours. You're good. You got, uh, let's just see if there are any, any of these garlic cloves are too big to successfully. Yeah, some of these are really enormous, so we're going to just kind of equalize them a little bit by cutting them in half. Some of these really big ones. So it's, it's, you're kind of ballparking it. And that's one of the things about this recipe that's really useful as a sort of a, I don't know, a training ground for kind of trusting yourself with recipes rather than saying it must be exactly half a teaspoon of this and you must cut these things to exactly that size and it must cook for exactly this long. The idea is to use your senses, your eyes, your you know, sense of smell and uh, your tactile abilities to kind of test for texture and kind of see the way it's supposed to be. And I will show you what that is and then by the time you're done with that, you'll know for the future. Yes, please, Maria. What's that mean? Tactile. Uh, that which you can perceive through touch. Ah, uh, my eyes. 
but a proper definition we probably have to look up. Well, you're lucky, Marissa. You're not the one chopping the onion. It's alright, Brian. Don't worry, I won't tell anybody about this one. Well, we have the garlic and the onions. What's next, Jim? We're going to put those into a pot with some butter and we're going to reduce them to a sloppy mass or melt them. First thing we're going to do is use some of this really beautiful cultured butter from Organic Valley that has real flavor but is unsalted and that way we have control over how much salt we add to the recipe. when we did this, we had the fat, the holy fat. Ah, oh, yeah, that was funny. <laughs> okay, we're gonna melt this up real good. Thought he got a little carried away with the butter. I think I always do. All right, let's keep the heat up on this so that it's different other heat, Jim. There we are, good. Due to the miracle of digital taping, we'll be able to compress that time significantly for you folks watching at home. Don't forget that this recipe and all of its instructions are on the internet. Just Google the Buke Schools and click on the frying pan with the Kids in the Kitchen logo. Uh -oh. Try to fling just a minimal amount of onions on the floor. <laughs> well, so you want to stir it up real good. I think we have enough right there. Oh, we do indeed. Plenty of onions. And we can have it on a pretty high heat in the first place. Later, we need to turn it down very, very low so that it does not scorch, because that's important to the recipe. But in the first place, we want to get everything nicely coated with butter. Burnt onions are probably no good. No. Oh, isn't that hot? Yeah. yeah. So, are you touching him? Yeah. Yeah. Like not touch Jim, is gas better, like this one, or is electric better, according to you? I was trained on flame, fire. That's, it's one of those primal things that I've always been used to and I like working with. Uh, as far as the world goes, though, I think we're moving towards a time in the not too distant future where there might not be a lot of gas flame available. Hopefully we'll always be able to cook over wood or things such as that. But uh, for the sheer sake of convenience and where the technology seems to be going, I think we're all, we're all heading towards electric kitchens at home. I think that's probably what it's going to be. So I'm trying to get used to that, and they're certainly improving them. So now electric stoves of today are vastly better than they were 15, 20 years ago even. Jim, when are we going to use the immersion blender? I want to see it in action. That's coming along very soon now. Uh, we've gotten our slop to the point where everything is very soft. And here's our test. This is what really shows us that the, the onions and garlic have gotten to a nice point of doneness. We pull out a, a nice fat clove of garlic, and we just kind of test it, and we see that it's it mashes pretty easily with the f with a fork. It just kind of turns into a like a mashed potato. That's what we're looking for. Okay. Once it does that, if it's not all hard and resisting, uh, if it is, if it's that point still, it's not done. The things aren't sweet enough. They aren't caramelized enough, and uh, the sugars in the onions are as important as the sugars in the sweet corn. So that's important stuff. Alrighty. I'm getting quite redundant today. I think direct from the Department of Redundancy Department. <laughs> I think many departments are redundant, but in my case, I just, I'm saying many things too many times today, and I don't know why that is. All right, good. So we're going to keep this warming nicely over the heat, because everything happens now. The slurry is nice and warm. We're going to take the corn and coat it. The thing about the frozen corn, which is great, is the individual kernels are frozen immediately after harvest, so all the sugars are retained. Oftentimes, even if you buy fresh corn off the shelf in season, sometimes it's been sitting for a couple of days, and so uh, the sugars start to dissipate. It doesn't have that wonderful sweetness that it could have you know, if you get it right out of the field. Well, this stuff is immediately what used to be called IQF, individually quick frozen, the kernels. So, but if you throw them in to this mass and uh, start to do other parts of the recipe, they will immediately form a gigantic frozen lump which is what we don't want, because we want to be able to have everything cycling nicely together and all the pieces to flow around. So when we buzz it up with that big blender, it all happens seamlessly. So let's get the corn in there. Corn Freezer's here. here. You've got it. Oh, we have something else. Oh, something indeed. Right. Yes. That's grand. You can bring them all out. Okay. And we'll open them and dump them ceremonially into the pot. <laughs> ready, ready? <laughs> Just an expression. We, we have to make the most out of our situation here. All of our knives seem to have disappeared. Can you bring one, if you bring one over? Oh, you know what? You can actually use one of these. This will be fine. So if you want to cut open these...
Excellent. Perfect. This is great. Now the onions and butter kind of coat the kernel so they won't all clump together when we pour in the milk, which is next. Thank you. I think we can get away with putting this in right now. This is good. The ratio looks excellent. So you can see that we had to transfer to a bigger pot because things were just kind of getting out of hand as far as volume goes. And we want to have plenty of soup because once people start eating this, everybody wants some because it's very tasty. And we want to add enough milk, and this, this is again where our, our senses come into play here, rather than just, you know, by rote measuring it out. Because there are so many variables with recipes like this, and with most real recipes in a real kitchen, you kind of got to eyeball it. So let's, uh, let me show you what I'm talking about. You see here, Ooh. Oh, wow. we have a good amount in there, and there's, there's some milk, and we can kind of stir it up, but it's not, it's not moving freely. We need more milk, because we want this to be a soup instead of a, a thick puree. So. Let's add a little more. Oh, that's getting better. That's more of what we're looking for. We'll probably end up using this whole amount here, I think. And what do we have? Yeah, there we are. Now you see how it's all kind of moving very nicely? And yet it's not swimming. The kernels themselves are not individually floating around and swimming in an ocean of milk, which would be just too much. Then you'd have a thin, milky soup, which is what we don't want. Excellent. Now, the next step is to crank the heat as high as we possibly can and get this boiling, because it must come up to the boil. And once it starts to foam up, and only just at that point, we use the big gigantic toy there, and uh, we buzz it up, put it through the strainer, season it with the cheese, the salt, and the dangerously hot chili sauce. Just a little bit to bring out the flavors, and uh, we're done. And then we commence to eat. Okay, we are foaming. It's beginning to bubble, and that's where we want it to be. We don't actually want it to foam up and boil over, otherwise we've got a huge mess on our hands. But uh, this should work out very well. We split it into two pots to kind of reduce the amount of time it took to heat it up. So we're going to recombine, and we're going to bring out that enormous device. The big or it's, toy? Uh, we are indeed. Or it's very effective stand-in. The big toy. Yep. That's nice. This has various speeds you can adjust it to. What we're, what our goal here is not only to mix the onions and garlic together, which are very soft, but to tear open the corn kernels. There'll be a certain amount of the exterior of the corn kernel that will get into the soup, but if we over grind it or get too much of the corn skin in, it tends to get kind of a, a dry or mealy character, which we really don't want. sure everything is thoroughly torn open. That smells pretty good. Yes, it does. Ooh. Now you see how the kernels look? You don't see any whole kernels anymore? They're kind of torn open. I think that's good. I think we strain now. Oh, no ready, ready? Use some big bread. That's it. Now what we don't do with this is we don't crack it on the counter, which is one of the favorite things that uh, people who are first timers in industrial kitchens want to do, which of course damages the extended noggin on this thing. And of course, in, uh, in any industrial application, even at home, the old standby duct tape helps keep things together in my kitchen as well as at home. All right, let's strain it out. Ready, ready? Indeed. Let's set that in there and we're gonna strain it. We're gonna put some, a little bit in at a time. Whew, beware, hot spattering stuff, very dangerous. I need that ladle, please, with the blue handle. Don't forget the bread. Bread in the oven, if someone would please put it into that very hot 400 degree oven, don't scorch yourselves. And just uh, the top of it, no sorry, the one next to you. Sorry, to your left. Other left, up above, there you go. 
and set it on the racks. Wonderful. That'll get all happy in there. We'll have some nice crusty bread to eat with this. What's the general wisdom about this? Corn, in the, in the elementary schools, they always have corn as a vegetable. Now, throughout history, corn has been honored as a grain. Why did they call it a vegetable? And in fact, my kids were faulted on a test because they referred to it as a grain. They were, of course, correct. But the administrators of the school, because of some uh, thing about their program, insisted that it be classed as a vegetable. It's always been a mystery to me because it isn't a vegetable. Anybody got an answer? I don't. Okay, we'll we'll have to uh, we'll have to look that up and kind of figure out why people have that stance. I mean, it's grown as a grain, just like wheat or anything. Absolutely. Else. <laughs> As we're waiting for our soup to be completed, let's go to Manners Make Magic. Hi, I'm Kenny, and this is Manners Make Magic. These are my co-hosts. Hi, I'm Marissa. And I'm Luke. Manners are important because if you have them, then people can feel comfortable. Well, how did manners evolve? Actually, some manners have been around since the beginning of time. You know, we have an expert on manners. Oh yeah? Who's that? Manners the Magnificent. Is he some kind of magician? Yes, he is. And if he's going to appear, we'll need to say the three magic words. What are they? Please, thank you, and you're welcome. Well, where is he? Well, if we want him to appear, we need to say him at the same time. One, two, three. Please, Please thank you, you're, you're welcome. welcome. Did someone call? Are you Manners the Magnificent? I am indeed. Pleased to make your acquaintance. Now, Manners, where exactly did Manners come from? Ever since people have lived together, there has been a need for social contract. In everyday life, there is a need for certain rules and guidelines to be followed so that people can live together harmoniously. I'm studying the Byzantine Empire in school, so do you mean to say that the manners that are popular back then are still in vogue today? The manners that we have now, the social contracts, the rules of etiquette, have changed since then and will continue to change as humans evolve, so do manners evolve. Well, manners, how has, say, greeting evolved over time? No, for example, a hundred years ago, if I were giving the same lesson, I would instruct you as to the proper way to shake my hand and to how to remove your hat if you were wearing one. And for you, young lady, your head would not be uncovered. You would be wearing a dress instead of slacks and a short sleeve shirt, and you would also be wearing gloves. And then I would also instruct you as the proper way to greet someone. Swell. Well, how firm and how long should the handshake be? Ah, excellent question. The handshake is very, very important. First thing is eye contact. You're already doing that. Very good. And you're already standing. If you were not standing, if you were seated in a waiting room, for example, in a parlor, you would first stand, you would make eye contact, extend your hand, and then a firm handshake for as long as it takes to acknowledge one another. So you don't want to hang on too long, right? No. You don't want to shake your hand too short because you might offend the other person and you don't want to shake on your hand, their hand too long because they might think that you are an unsavory type. We don't want to be unsavory. No, we don't. So how did the lady shake hands? Well, for example, put your arm out. Actually, that's perfect. Your hand would be like so. Okay. But now, let's try this again because women and men are on equal footing. Mm -hmm. Let's try the handshake again. It would just be a normal, very nicely done. Or one may shake hands as so. <laughs> <coughs> well, the handshake's used in America, but what about the rest of the world? Do they use a handshake? Very good question. There are many countries who use the handshake, but it is a decidedly Western convention. For example, if you were living in Japan, the eye contact would not be a factor, and you would be bowing, like so. Okay. If you were in India, you might say, Namaste. The handshake is Western now, but is spreading throughout the world. Precisely. That's because as our culture is spreading throughout the world, so do our customs. Well, that's this episode of Manners Make Magic. Thanks, Manners. Thank you, young lady. And you, sir? Mm -hmm. And you, sir.
We've added just enough chili to kind of give it just a little bit of a at the back of the throat, just a bit. Not a big giant uh, head rush of, uh, of heat. But now we're adding some salt, a couple of pinches at a time, because it's very easy to oversalt something. And once it's in there, you can't get it out of there. So give that a good whisk, and I'm going to snag another spoon or two here. Taste that. There we are. Thank you. If you hold for one moment. Holding. That's getting pretty good. And again. <laughs> We're going to season it up just a little more. Jim, I have a question. Yes, indeed. For the peppers, are the seeds the hottest part of them, or is it the actual oh, ribs? Or? Yeah. That's good. And a good question. Um, the seeds actually have the least amount, technically, of the, the heat-containing substance in chilies, which is called capsaicin. But uh, because they are attached to the chili at the ribs, the ribs, that pithy, sort of foamy white part that's inside a pepper uh, when they're fresh, those are the highest concentration of capsaicin in the chilies, more than the actual flesh of the chili itself. So because they have that little bit attached to them, and of course when you shake some seeds out on a pizza, it does seem very hot and spicy because there, that stuff is attached to them. And also just the whole contact thing in storage. But uh, that's the story. Okay, we're whisking it in. If you could put in a little more cheese. Yes. Excellent. And some more. Let's stop there and we'll whisk it in and see what we get here. Because this enhances the flavor but also the texture of the soup a little bit. You can see it's got a really nice creamy texture already. And all of that body really comes from the vegetables that we buzzed into it. So it most cream soups are just devastatingly rich and don't really have that much nutrition in them. This is loaded with vegetables, vegetable fiber, and uh, all kinds of goodies. Pardon me? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, a little extra cheese, I see. Yes, I need to bring that right now. That's all good. Thank you very much. Hey, don't have the cheese. Okay. This is not. Uh, this isn't terribly hot. This shouldn't hurt the uh, countertop. Can you scoot down? Oh my! You can put a little garnish in this if you want. You can sprinkle some parsley on it, or a little fine, fine, tiny dice, or a brunoise of uh, bell pepper for some color. A lot of ways to do it. But uh, it's also nice just to have a bowl of soup as it is. I've slopped it up real good there for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, smell it. I mean, get the get the aroma off that stuff. It's got a really nice. Mm. What are we going to do with the extra the kernels? The slop that can all be tossed out, or you can uh, feed it to the hogs if you got some of those out back. They'll love it. I see why they call it slop now. Mm -hmm. It can also be incorporated into a bread you, if you uh, are at all skilled at baking. Uh, you can adjust your quantities and uh, incorporate that as the moist part of the material, and you could probably make a really interesting bread out of that. And that way it would be utilized because there's plenty of good stuff in there still, even though we've squozed much of it out. Hmm. You're just giving me an idea. What? I'm going to experiment with that this week. I'm going to take the slop and I'm going to try to make some bread out of it. Okay. Good call. Cool. Well, I mean, something's got to happen to it. Indeed. And better that it be used than it be merely discarded. Yes. See what you think. Let me uh, cut up some bread. Smell. I have a knife somewhere. Yes. A slicer. Here we are. I can really smell the cheese in it. That is really good. Excuse me, we're yeah, going to jump in here really fast. Really good. Okay. Yeah, mm. try as soon as you think. Have we got a spoon? Mm. That's great. That's good. That's really good. Mm. Wow, this beats my mom. Uh oh. Edit that out. <laughs> Let's make yeah. mom very unhappy. Any questions that you'd like to ask Jim, ask him now. Ready? Go. How again do you get to the website for this recipe? This has been a wonderful first episode of the second season of Kids in the Kitchen. I'd like to thank my co-hosts, Brian, Kenny, and Maria. I'd like to thank Megan Dalsing for taking us shopping. And I'd like to thank Jim Terry for being here and for the extra cheese. Thanks, Jim. And that's it for the first episode of the second season of Kids in the Kitchen. <laughs>